Hi, folks. Pastor Mike Spalding here with my good friend and big brother. I am Pastor Casper, and we're here together to encourage you to keep listening to Deception Detection Radio, because we're both on this network with our individual shows. Yes, and yes. And we're going to be doing some things together as well, not, not just saying them all. Hey, folks, tune in Deception Detection Radio, some of the best programming in Christian talk, news, encouragement, and Bible studies. God bless you. God bless you. In the sky, gazing far into the night, I raise my hand to the fire, but it's no use, cause you can't stop it from shining through, it's true, baby let the light shine through, if you believe it's true, baby won't you let the light shine through, for you. Deception Detection Radio. I'm Kay. And I'm Chad. We pray you all had a blessed week. What was the judgment of the Nephilim? Tonight we're joined by Ryan Peterson, author of Judgment of the Nephilim, and we're going to talk about that and try to find out exactly what that was. Let's go to the interview. Welcome, Ryan. It's wonderful to have you join Chad and I. How are you? I am great. Thank you so much for having me. I'm very excited to be on the show. We are excited to have you on. You have written such a wonderful book that the word about it needs to get out there. So would you please say the opening prayer? Oh, absolutely. Heavenly Father, thank you so much for this time, Lord. And as we come together, Lord, to just have this show, I thank you for this time that we can have this platform as believers in your word, in your gospel, and our Savior, Jesus Christ, that you've given us the freedom uh, and this and, and empowered us to proclaim your word, Lord. And I just pray in everything we do today that you are glorified, that Christ, our Savior, is uplifted, Lord. So guide our thoughts, our energy, our words, Lord, to know that in everything we see in the Bible, everything we examine, it all comes back to you, Lord Jesus Christ. This is all about you, your work, your redemption of us, Lord. So we pray now, bless us, bless all those who listen, Lord. Let your word set in their hearts, Lord. Let your gospel seeds be planted and let you be glorified and magnified in this time. In Jesus' holy and most precious name, amen. 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 Thank you, Ryan. Well, Ryan, uh, this is your first time on with us, and I'd like to have you please let people know a little bit about yourself and how you went from being a corporate attorney to writing your book, Judgment of the Nephilim. Yeah, uh, sure. Great question. And so, of course, you know, my name is Ryan Peterson. I am uh, born in New York, born in New York City. I was uh, raised by uh, my, my family's – all my family is actually originally from Jamaica in the Caribbean. And uh, I grew up in a Bible-believing home. I really grew up as a Bible-believing Christian. My mother is a Bible-believing Christian and really reading the Bible, studying the Word. Voracious reader as a kid in the extreme. I love to read everything I get my hands on. And I really felt from a very young age that the Bible – was divinely inspired. I read lots of the classic great authors, and I felt there was no book that could compare to the Bible. And so, so um, that was kind of my upbringing. And then going into college, and I went to law school in Manhattan. I uh, basically was my heart was really set on a career, really working kind of in government, DC, and politics. That was really my passion. I actually had. A, uh, I worked for a summer after my first summer, my first year of law school in Washington, D.C. I worked in the U.S. Senate as an intern, technically a fellow and a fellowship for a U.S. senator and really became kind of disillusioned with it. And so upon graduation, I, I started working for a corporate law firm in Wall Street. And, you know, I was in I was at a very I was in a very competitive environment. So I was a, it was very academically competitive. And so. As strange as it may seem, 
working in corporate America was was a kind of not that difficult coming out of the the uh, schooling I was in and with the kind of the, the people I went to school with. And so it was kind of like a natural progression that most people did. And I was living in New York City. I was very young and definitely by every worldly perspective was probably living in a worldly view, a successful, great life. And spiritually, it was a very dark an empty time in my life. I just wasn't, I didn't have any spiritual direction. I was still a Christian. I still believed the Bible, but I wasn't attending church regularly. I wasn't serving in any capacity. And I really just didn't know where my life was going, even though I was in a good career working for a very established law firm and seemingly on a good track. And what really, so that, and that continued for about five, seven, six, five to seven years of living like that and really kind of living one foot in the world, one foot in the church and not honoring God at all in my behavior or, or and just and my Christian walk. And what really pulled me out of that by God's grace was really uh, end times ministries. I started, you know, as someone, even though I wasn't working in politics, I was still follow politics very closely and still do. And I started stumbling upon, you know, blogs on, you know, that were focused on end times prophecy. And that was that was a part of the Bible I was never really that into. And it, once I saw the way that world events were converging with Bible prophecy, it really just blew me away and convicted me. And I thought I have to get back into church and in a major way. And it really just did. Um, uh, it really, God just did a, a work in my heart. I can actually tell you, I was actually in Stockholm, Sweden, uh, with my two best friends, two guys I went to college with, and we were traveling. We we're on a just on a vacation, just traveling through Europe, having fun, going partying, and just you know, um, living worldly. And I was, you know, we were they they were all getting ready to go out, and I was just here reading this website about Bible prophecy. And I said, you know what, I'm done. I'm not going to do this anymore. I have to get in the church. I know I have to just fully devote to God. And so, I went back home and started. I found a Bible believing church in the New York City area. I worked. I served there for many years. I, in every role, I was a teacher. I was a deacon. Uh, I cleaned the church and I served as a missionary in Belize, uh, which is one of the best experiences of my life and really just started to f- fully pour all my energy into serving God. And um, from there, it was just um, it's just been it was obviously life changing. It just in my adult it, as an adult, it really is me stepping into my purpose for God as an adult. And um, again, by God's grace, I was able to. Uh, marry a Bible-believing woman, my wife, Erica, and she actually was the one who kind of directed me to start writing. I always had a passion for writing. This actually isn't even the first book I've written, but this is the first book I've published. And she said, you know, you should really start um, writing because I was just like, you know, every night you're just here, whether you're on this message board, this Christian message board, or this Christian website, and you're just writing and debating with everybody. She's like, why don't you just start a blog? And that's what I did. And that's really what kind of got me introduced to Christian writing. Um, and the Nephilim was that I was, uh, I started a, a blog that was really about end time Bible prophecy, Christian news. And in that time I was doing lots of research. I was constantly buying books and DVDs and I got a package of DVDs and where one of the DVDs that was thrown in was about the Nephilim. And it was cool. And it was like my, it was really my intro. Again, I knew nothing about this. It was not something I ever studied when I was young or heard about in Sunday school or in church or anything like that. And once I watched it, I was just blown away because I understood at that point that there was a whole context and subtext to the events of the Old Testament that I was completely missing out on. And once I understood that, and the supernatural interpretation of Genesis 6, I, I really got sucked in. And that's when all I think of, it's amazing how God works because all of my experience going to law school, working as a lawyer, loving research, loving writing, that's when it came out. And I started researching it heavily. And what I really saw there was that I felt like there was a distinct need for a book on the Nephilim that really went through 
the Bible in a very methodical fashion to bring out how this isn't just about Genesis 6. This goes from Genesis 6 all through the first five books of the Bible into the wars in Canaan with Joshua and even into the New Testament and how this war between these two bloodlines, how it is going to manifest all the way down to the second coming of the Lord Jesus Christ and the Great Tribulation. And so, and I felt that one thing I noticed was that a lot of when I spoke to people I knew about it and said, hey, do you know about the Nephilim or the Nephilim and the giants and this? And people, there were many people I knew who were Christians who had heard of it and were familiar with it, but they were very hesitant because they said, well, you know, I read about it or I read a book or I read an article or I watched a video on it and they take from different sources. It's not all from the Bible. It's coming from either the Apocrypha or it's coming from Sumerian culture or the Egyptian Book of the Dead. And I knew that that was – a stumbling that was that was always going to be something that was going to hold back a lot of the church from understanding or even wanting to consider this as a valid interpretation of scripture. And so I said, I want to make a book that you can bring into any church, Bible study, small group study, Christian school, and it's strictly based on scripture because I believe that you can establish the validity of the supernatural account of Genesis 6 based on the Bible alone. And so that really is what took me here. Oh, it's it's an amazing book because you do use strictly the Bible to prove the existence of the Nephilim and the and the trail and it's just amazing and it's God inspired because the research, how long did it take you to write? Yeah, I, I, I say it took me about three years. I really spent a lot of time researching before I was actually writing. Um, so it really about three years. Cause I, 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 you know, I wanted also to not just, uh, show that it can be established from the Bible, but I also wanted to highlight the fact that this is not a new interpretation, right? This is not an idea from the past 20 years that L.A. Marzulli came up with. This is something that goes back centuries, back to the church fathers, back to the first, second, third century, all the way through the 17th, 18th, 19th centuries, and show the rich history of theologians, pastors, laymen, laywomen who wrote about the Nephilim over the centuries and bring that out. So it took a lot of time to go through their writings to establish that as well. Well, it's it's very comprehensive and it seems like it took a lot longer or it would have. Um, Chad, I know you had uh, some questions for Ryan. I'm going to give it over to you. Well, I know that one of the uh, persons that you gave a shout out to was a woman from the 1920s. Um, you uh, mentioned her that uh, she was a big help in your research. Yeah, sure, Emma Penny. <laughs> and um, you know the the interesting thing, <laughs> but it's a perfect example of what I was talking about when I talk about the history because you know uh, she wrote the book The Sons of God and Their Inheritance. And in the you know I've tried my best. I mean I actually own the book. I own a hard copy of the book. She wrote that in 1921, and. But there's nothing – I can't actually find – as far as I can see, she didn't even have any position in a church. She wasn't a professor or a theologian, just like an, a, an academic, so to speak. I think she was just a lay woman who – but she wrote some very powerful conclusions about the sons of God, the fallen angels, about the Nephilim. And so one of the things I point to, uh, you know, my, my, my book and my interpretation – on some of the kind of the more common understandings and interpretations of what happened with the, with Genesis six and the Nephilim, I, I kind of diverge from some of that. And one one of the things I really point to is, and I you know what I call the first family of the Nephilim, and I believe that the Bible identifies the first uh, you know bride, so to speak, of the fallen angels and mother of the Nephilim. And I think that again is Nema, who's identified in, in Genesis chapter 4. And, you know, we can talk about how I arrive at that conclusion, but I bring that up because, you know, Emma Penny, you know, almost a century ago was able to come to this exact same con- conclusion and say it was in the line of Cain that his offspring were the ones who uh, were basically the progenitors of the Nephilim and even was able to identify 
another another point I believe is that you know I don't believe in a second incursion. I don't believe that the fallen angels uh, took human wives ever again. I think there's a very important biblical reasons for why that was the case. But how did the Nephilim return? I think she also arrived at the same conclusion that the DNA came through on the Ark. And again, these are just some startling, you know, it was just for me to see that someone who seemingly was not even an academic or a theologian came to that conclusion just writing her own book about the sons of God and fallen angels and the giants. It was really amazing. Yeah, I totally agree. And uh, definitely want to go ahead. And I guess at this point, we can go ahead and jump into. Uh, chapter 4, where you were basically alluding to a while ago about the uh, first family of the Nephilim and how you traced all that. And you you specifically mentioned in there that um, Eve was the first woman mentioned in the Bible and that the women that followed after that. So I'll let you go ahead and take it from there. Yeah, sure. So, uh, so in identifying, I, I believe the Bible... Especially when you're talking about Genesis, the first five books of the Bible, the books of Moses, uh, when you were looking at lineages and genealogies that I, I just call it a special reference where the Bible will, rather than just going through the generations, one father, one son, one father, one son, Abraham begat Isaac, Isaac begat Jacob, and so on, that scripture will make devote you know, three, four, five verses to one person. And I believe what the reasoning for that is that the Bible is directing us to say this is someone who was very significant and particularly infamous in biblical history. Most of the time, it's an infamous figure, not a righteous figure. And where I landed with this in in connection to Genesis 6 was that in the lineage of Cain, who, of course, was the wicked son of Adam and Eve, who killed his brother Abel, who was banished from Eden altogether and set to wander the land, he started obviously his own lineage. And when you look at the seventh, when his lineage is detailed in Genesis chapter four, Lamech, and of course this Lamech is the Lamech who is descendant of Cain. He is not the not he is not the descendant of Seth or the father of Noah. He, this is Lamech who is the seventh from Adam through Cain's lineage. He gets six verses devoted to describing detailing him and then his family. And I think it's really something important that scripture is telling us this is someone you need to examine. Something very significant happened historically in this family's generation. And of course, when you get to this, we're in Genesis 4, starting in verses 19 to 22, you have Lamech and it says that he took unto him two wives. So right there. We're already seeing some linguistic similarities between Lamech and the sons of God in Genesis 6, the fallen angels who took human wives, because it took unto them wives. They took wives unto themselves. Similarly, Lamech took wives. And what's also significant about that is that Lamech was the first person on record to violate God's marital covenant. God's covenant was one man, one woman, cleaved eternally forever. Lamech was a polygamist, and he took two wives, Ada and Zillah. And then not only are we told about his wives, we then learn about all three of his sons. We, you know, Jabal, Jubal, Tubalcain, they are all named. And we see that Lamech's heart clearly is in rebellion against God. He boasts about slaying a man. He mocks the protection that God gave Cain when God put the sign, the mark on Cain to uh, protect him from anyone trying to avenge Abel's death. You know, he says that if Cain was avenged sevenfold, Lamech will be avenged 70 and sevenfold, just mocking God's grace. So clearly this was a man in deep spiritual rebellion. And I think, and he showed, and the interesting thing too, is that when you look at Adam and Eve, of course, they sit in the garden, God immediately judges them. Cain slays slays Abel. He is judged by God. Lamech took two wives. God did not immediately judge him. God didn't come down and speak to him at all. And so already we're seeing that he not only violated the marital covenant, he was also, God didn't deal with his sin immediately. And I think that also could have played a factor in instigating the angels to say, this is a target for someone we can pursue this illicit fornication with to lead, which led to Genesis six. And I think that what, uh, 
the the other main piece of evidence I look to is the fact that when it gets to his three sons, you see this intellectual explosion. So you have Jay Ball, who is the father of animal husbandry, of tent making. Jew Ball was the inventor of instruments. He created music, musical instruments. The Jubilee is the root of that term is comes from his name for the horns that are played during the Jubilee. And then Tubal Cain, of course, was the father of blacksmithing, whether we're talking about making weapons or making tools. And so you have this again, this there there are forefathers of these of these arts and sciences. And I submit that that was the transaction that eventually they essentially they received divine knowledge in exchange for the hand of a woman in marriage. And who that woman was, was Nama, Nama, because scripture then says, and Nama, the sister of Tubal Cain was Nama. And again, that's Genesis 4, 22. And what's amazing to me is that you never see a sister described. You don't even see three sons in one generation described in biblical lineages. And yet in this family, everyone is detailed. And as you already alluded to, Chad, you know, I, I point out that in the you know, 1,656 years of history before the flood, as recorded in the Bible, the only women mentioned by name are Eve and these three women in this family, Ada, Zilla, and Nama. And that's it. So I think, again, the scripture, even though this is just seems like a small passage, I think the Bible is telling us slow down. This family had a huge, huge significance. And I, and I show again when we talk about, you know, the history of understanding this and the, and the theologians who, you know, saw the same thing, I, I quote. Uh, a professor, a Christian, theolo- you know, a theologian, his name is Robert Jenkin. This is writing in 1721 on this very point. And he says, Moses seems to refer to some things that happened near the beginning of the world as well known in his time, as in Genesis 422, where he says the sister of Tubal Cain was Nama. For no probable account can be given why Nama should be mentioned, but because her name was then well known among the Israelites, for some reason, which it does not, which it does not concern us to be acquainted with, but which served to confirm to them the rest of the relation. Some have delivered that Nama, by her beauty, enticed the sons of God. And you know, I cite another you know publication, the Rainbow Magazine, a Christian magazine, in eighteen eighty three, that came to the same conclusion that points to Nama as being this woman. And even when you look at apocryphal sources like the Book of Enoch. You know, they where it explicitly says in the book of Enoch that the angels who fell and took human wives gave exchange knowledge, you know, and taught arts and different crafts and sciences to humanity when they took human wives. That this was a transaction that was taking place. And it wouldn't even really be the only time in scripture that knowledge is passed on supernaturally. And I really wanted to point that out too, because, you know, there's a passage in Ezekiel 31 where God is instructing Moses and Aaron on how to make the, the tools for the tabernacle. And God says that he's picked certain men and endowed them supernaturally with knowledge to make, you know, items, whether it's cutting works in gold and silver and brass. And they were literally, it was, you know, like downloaded into their minds by God to, to craft metal, the same ability that Tubal Cain was the father of crafting metal. So I think when you look at the totality of it, that this was the family where the incursion took place and Nama was particularly singled out because she was that first bride of a fallen angel and the first mother of a Nephilim giant. Ryan, um, I've got a, a question for you on that. When the fallen angels were with the women and the giants came. Could we actually say that, well, we know in the Bible it states that it will be as in the days of Noah, the coming, the second coming of the Son of Man. Now, would that be the first instance of transhumanism? Absolutely. Absolutely. I think that's really, you know, and when you think about it, it was the first achieved instance, right? Because the first offered was in Genesis chapter three, when 
Satan told Eve, ye shall be as gods. In other words, you will transform. I believe he was offering her saying that the, if she disobeyed God, she would become something greater than human, than a normal human being. But what we see is in Genesis 6, the first actual achievement of you know, human 2.0, homo novus, or whatever term we now use in the transhumanist movement for the evolved human. And that's, that is the Nephilim giant, the hybrid. The, and so I, I would agree that is the first instance of transhumanism. Yeah, your book, that it, it clicked with me on that. Um, it really had me curious. That's interesting because it does link us back to the days of Noah and where we're headed now. A- a- absolutely, a- I-, I I agree. That's a very uh, that's a very astute way of putting it. <laughs> it's amazing, Chad. I know you had more. <laughs> I'm just hopping in here and there. Oh, that's fine. Uh, yeah, I also wanted to touch on Chapter Five, the Mount Hermon and the Jordan River. Yeah, sure. So uh, again, you know, I think that it's very. You know, it's very accepted and discussed that Mount Hermon was the location, the landing spot for the angels who sinned in Genesis 6, that that's where they kind of had their meeting and it was named because they took an oath. And of course, that's that's directly from the book of Enoch. And so, but again, you know, since my book is deriving everything from scripture, I really wanted to start with a blank slate and make no assumptions and really let scripture speak to me and kind of guide me in figuring out this whole account and everything I looked at and my research led me to the Jordan river um, as the location, the landing spot, so to speak for the fallen angels who took wives in Genesis six. And I think that uh, it's really fascinating. I think when you start to look and examine the amount of supernatural occurrences that take place at the Jordan River in the Bible. It's pretty astounding. And I, I call it in the book, I call it the Area 51 of the Bible because so many supernatural occurrences take place there. And so um, just to give some examples, I start off talking about even from the time that Abraham and Lot had to divide their land because their servants were feuding with each other. And Abraham said, you, you pick, you know, your, whatever you pick first, essentially. It said that Lot looked at the well-watered plains of the Jordan and they were as the Garden of Eden. So right there, from me, from my perspective, I started thinking, okay, well, there's something significant from a supernatural standpoint taking place uh, around the Jordan, because it's being compared to the Garden of Eden, which I believe certainly was a supernatural location as it was created by God. And then you can look at other examples. Uh, certainly, uh, when uh, Jacob saw the angels in desc- ascending and descending from heaven on the ladder, his dream that was at Bethel, you know, due west of the Jordan River, Joshua leading the Israelites into the promised land. And remember that the Jordan River was the entrance, was the entrance that God specifically designated for the Israelites to enter the promised land. Egypt, of course, where the Exodus, where the Israelites came out of, is southwest of biblical, the biblical location of Israel, the biblical borders, I should say, of Israel. So so rather than just coming on say you know directly from the south into the nation of Israel, the Promised Land. God had the Israelites go all the way around the the southern per- border and perimeter around to the to the eastern side to enter at the Jordan River. And what happened then? There was this ritual, you know, that we don't really discuss much that God commanded for the priest to hold the ark, the Red Sea. I'm sorry, the Jordan parted just like the Red Sea. It parted and divided to allow the entire nation to walk in on dry land. The priests carrying the Ark of the Covenant before the people, they took 12 stones, put 12 on the bottom of the sea, of the the river, the riverbed. 12 were placed and stacked on on, on the shore of it. And, you know, there was this big supernatural procession that took place at the Jordan River. Elijah, the prophet, also parted the Jordan River when he hid it with his mantle, when he was going to be raptured and taken up to heaven where did it happen? At the Jordan River. And of course, Elisha came with him and the other the other uh, prophets from the school of the prophets, and they witnessed him at the Jordan, taken up by chariots and angels 
up into heaven. And then Elisha himself was also able to part the waters of the Jordan River. You have Naaman, the Syrian uh, military leader who had leprosy, was the only leper healed in the Old Testament until Christ came. And how did it happen? Elisha told him, dip yourself in the Jordan River seven times. And then uh, I also point to just the, what I think is, the, the, you know, by far the greatest supernatural event that took place at the Jordan River was the baptism of our Lord Jesus Christ. And what happened? He came. Jesus chose to come to see John the Baptist at the Jordan River to be baptized. And once he was baptized, we again have the heavens opened, the intersection of the heavenly realm and the human realm. The Holy Spirit descended like a dove upon Jesus. And of course, God the Father spoke from heaven saying, this is my son in whom I am well pleased. And I even go back and show that the even the very etymology of Jordan is uh, means the, to their descent or the place of their descent. And I quote Origen, um, obviously writing in the second century, say coming to that conclusion that this was connected to the angels who descended in Genesis 6. And um, and so you have to wonder even why was it given the name Jordan? You know, if it's why would it why would that river be called the place of their descent um, unless someone or something or some beings descended there to give it that notoriety? And so all, everything I looked to really took me to the Jordan River as the the uh, much more likely place that the angels came down and descended uh, in the days of Noah. Interesting. Because uh, I'm not sure if you're familiar with uh, David Flynn's research at all. Yes, yeah, yeah. I, I'm very, very familiar with, with uh, David Flynn's research. Yeah, because that was one of the things that he actually talked about was about Mount Hermon being on the 33rd parallel and that Roswell also falls on the 33rd parallel as well. Um, that That's when we saw the big uptick where a lot of things were going on and we had the uptick and all the UFOs and aliens and so on. Um, but yeah, that, I mean, that's interesting. Yeah. You know, and, and I don't, I don't discount that there, there could be supernatural properties and Mount Hermon on the 33rd parallel. But again, just going by scripture, um, which is really was, you know, my focus for the book, you know, Mount Hermon is only mentioned a couple of times in the Bible at all. And um, whereas the Jordan River has, you know, about two, almost 200 references uh, in scripture. So I just, again, you know, and I, and I think it's good. You know, I think that we should be debating and discussing these things, right? This is what the apostles were doing. They're trying to reason with the scriptures and figure out, well, what is God telling us? And I think, you know, where David Flynn was really kind of like for this generation, he was really like a pioneer and really getting deep into these things. And uh, so I think it's exciting that, you know, um, we can see like, is it Mount Hermon or could it be the Jordan River? You know, I think it's, you know, I, I, and I'm, so I'm, I'm just trying to bring up perspective, I think, to the table. And I think that, you know, the kind of exchange and discourse is good. I think this is what we should be doing because we are trying to search the scriptures. So now does this also tie in with like the Euphrates and uh, the bottomless pit and Abaddon and Apollyon and all that? Yeah. And I, and then the other thing too, and that's, that's another reason that's a great point too, is that I also just show that beyond the Jordan River that you have lots of – once you go beyond the Jordan River and just talk about rivers in general in Scripture, there you have a lot of uh, references to angels. Whether you're talking about uh, uh, Daniel you know, in chapters 10 and 11 where he sees angels and I believe he also sees the pre-incarnate Lord – you know, on either side of a river and the Lord standing on the river, on the water, one foot on the water, one foot off on the land. And you have uh, Ezekiel at the river Chiba, Kibar encountering a number of angels. Same thing at the Great River uh, when we're talking about the Tigris, the Euphrates. So, yeah. And, you, of course, you know, we see in Revelation that there are angels who presently are bound in the Euphrates River who will be released, obviously, in the Great Tribulation. I think there's a lot of connection between rivers and angels in general just even beyond the jordan river that's interesting yeah uh, i was thinking that when you started talking about the 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 jordan river i was like 
I wonder if that's exactly where he was going to be heading. But, uh, yeah, you, you tied into some of that. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And, and you know, I'm, I'm in my current research um, that I'm working on, I'm definitely going to be exploring the Euphrates River much more because my current research is focused on, you know, the Nephilim and Fallen Angels, but from a more an end times perspective. So and that's, not, you know, when they return and things like that nature. So, yeah, so uh, more to come on that. But I think I am in full agreement. There's a lot of significance there. Yeah, and that's another thing I like about you is that you uh... – you are uh, pretty well versed in apologetics. Um, we were talking briefly about that when we first got together um, and started talking. Um, the uh, the thing about Enoch, and I know that a lot of people do have issues when we start getting into the apocrypha and, and the extra biblical text, but uh, that's that's one thing that, like I said, if you've done your due diligence on Enoch, and we're talking about Enoch one. Uh, Jesus quoted from it, his brother Jude quoted from it, and even James. His other half brother, he also quoted from it. So that's that's one thing that Christians eventually have to come to uh, a consensus on and understand that you know they were all aware of it. They all knew knew of the Book of Enoch, and like I said, Jude quoted from it verbatim an entire paragraph. Yeah, and, and no, there's no doubt that. The Book of Enoch. I don't know if it was the exact version we have today, obviously, but it was it was in circulation in the first century A.D. in Judea, so it was a known text. That that um, I, I think there's a lot of historical support for that. Uh, but you know, you know, my uh, kind of treatment, I guess, of the Book of Enoch and the Book of Jasher, which are really the two extra biblical books I focus on in the book in one particular chapter. My my approach was I'm just going to treat these books, like any sermon I hear, like any podcast, I'm just going to hold it up to the lens of the Bible and see and identify what lines up with scripture and what doesn't. And they're a historical texts. They, they've obviously inspired and ignited the, the, the kind of resurgence of looking at these texts have led to so much research, so much excitement about the Bible. So I think it's great that they have done those, but I think that as long as we understand them in their proper context, they are historical sources that were certainly known in the early Christian and definitely in the Jewish community um, in the early centuries um, AD and in BC times as well. And, um, and, and see them that way. I think it's, I think that's really, they, they, we don't have to be scared of these books that we should, but we can just view them in their proper context and let them help inform our understanding of the greater context of what was going on. And know that, you know, it's, I don't believe it's inspired, divinely inspired scripture, but again, it doesn't mean that there are other texts that are quoted in the Bible that aren't doesn't mean it's a wholesale endorsement of the entire book of, their, of that author, but at the same time, they had truths that could that were validated by the Holy Spirit and expressed by the pens of the apostles who wrote them. So that's how I kind of see the apocryphal texts. They're like history books. They they don't exactly have to be part of the Bible, but as you said, we hold it up to the Bible. And if something doesn't fit, then we have to disregard that. But like the book of Enoch, it's it's a history book that adds more to what we're reading from the Bible. Right. And that's it. And, and then that's the challenge. I mean, you know, as we grow from the milk to the meat, that's the challenge of a Christian every day. Right. If you're listening to this podcast, it doesn't even have to be a sermon. If you're listening to anyone who is trying to teach or explain the word of God, it is your duty as a Christian to, you know, go search the scriptures to see if it was so, to be a Berean. And so I think as long as we're doing that, then we can really look at anything. And if there's more, you know, things to glean from a historical, historical standpoint and give us greater and fuller understanding, then the better. So, Enoch has been pulled in a lot of different directions. Some see him as more of being on the side of the Nephilim, as your book talks about. Uh, because he was around then, then they talked about Enochian magic, uh, just different things with Enoch. So well, there, it's, there it's was, based... there was there was also two Enochs. There was there was the good one and right. there was the bad one. That's the thing of the whole Enochian magic and Gnosticism. That's the bad Enoch. Yeah, that's books two and three. 
and then we have the good Enoch, which is book number one. Yeah, I agree. Enoch is like, he is such a celebrity. Like he is trending like majorly right now in, in the, in the Christian community, in the new age community, in the occult community, he his somehow he has become so popular. And, and like you said, he used in so many ways that people are claiming him for all sorts of different roles. But what I really wanted to show uh, in the biblical, uh, you know, kind of examination and detail and history of Enoch was that I think that we underestimate the impact of Enoch being translated. And I really want to try and bring out how powerful of a testimony for God that would have been at the time Enoch was alive. Now, remember, Enoch was the seventh from Adam through the godly line. So his cousin, his contemporary was Lamech. So at the very time that all this was happening, the sons of God, if you – it, you know, uh, we're taking wives and you see Lamech's sons, they're, they're, again, they're creating blacksmithing, they're playing music, they have instruments, they're doing, the, they're, they're mass producing cattle and animal husbandry. So they're, they're looking like they have the knowledge, they have the true knowledge because they have connected with the fallen angels and they have, they're giving birth to hybrid offspring, the Superman, the Nephilim, these giants, you know, the appeal uh, at that time to the fallen angels and their doctrines and the way of Satan must have been so great in the world. And of course, that's the testimony of Genesis 6 and 7, that the the thoughts of man was only evil continually. The Nephilim didn't just corrupt us genetically. They were corrupting us morally and degrading us in society is becoming more depraved. And here you have Enoch who, uh, you know, at the birth of his son, you know, decides to start walking with God. And I believe that's because he got a revelation that Methuselah was going to be essentially the doomsday clock for the world, for the judgment of God to come upon the world, that he, of course, is walking with God, standing opposed to everything that is going on with the Nephilim, with these marriages taking place, with these hybrids who are just destroying everything and becoming the, the demigods of the world. You have this one man standing for God who then is supernaturally, obviously, translated, given the immortal body and brought to heaven. And so, and I think that, you know, I think it's a powerful testament because you can see that for everything the fallen angels could offer and for the, the, the birth of the giants and the Superman and this era in the, in, the, in the antediluvian era, they couldn't give immortal life. People were still dying. You know, there was no immortality linked to them. And here you had a man who was just living for God, day by day, and he was able to go to heaven. He was able to ascend. He was able to do what the Nephilim couldn't do, what the fallen angels couldn't get humanity to do, Enoch could do. And I think it's really important to understand that testimony. And what I love, too, is that it says that Enoch was translated by God and he was not found. Well, that that's the exact phrase that was used when Elijah was raptured, that he was not found. And we know from scripture that people were searching for Elijah. They thought maybe God just took him to a mountain, that maybe God just kind of teleported him. He didn't take him, actually translate him and bring him to heaven. And so I think the same thing happened with Enoch, that it was a public event, that people knew Enoch was taken up to heaven and actually looked for him to confirm that was the case. And so I think it was God showing that, Yes, this world is falling into deep depravity. Yes, it appears that those who are evil and wicked have the best of everything. They have the technology. They have the wealth. They have the music and the fun. But those who walk with me have the true reward, which is eternal life in heaven. And I've just proved it now that even before you die, you can see heaven if you trust in me. Yeah, because when uh, Methuselah, his name meant that his death shall bring, like you said, he was the... uh, (laughs) He was the uh, countdown clock or the let them know that, you know, it had come about because it was exactly one week after he died that the flood came. Precisely. Yeah. When he when he dies, it shall come. The judgment was coming. And so, you know, I think that's what that revelation at his birth is what let Enoch to because you see that from the time it's from the time that Methuselah was born that Enoch walked with God. And so I think that set him on that course. And of course, obviously, he got other revelation because he gave the prophecy that we again that we see in Jude that is also written in the book of Enoch. So he clearly obviously was getting divine revelation from God, prophetic revelation. So I got to ask you real quick, because I, I, I think you're you're trucking along the same line that I am. 
you believe that uh, Enoch and Elijah are going to be the two witnesses? <laughs> oh, great question. Um, you know, I, I've I've thought about this a lot, and I, you might actually be surprised by who I think are the two witnesses. So I, I actually think the two witnesses are going to be uh, uh, Joshua and Zerubbabel. Joshua, the 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 high priest, not Joshua, uh, the the uh, the. Uh, who led Israel into the promised land, who obviously was serving under Moses, Joshua, the high priest in the days of Zechariah and Zerubbabel. And so if we want to go down that rabbit trail, I'll I'll just briefly say that when you look in the book of Haggai and in uh, the book of Zechariah, when you see the references to both of these men, uh, they are, I think there's some parallels between that and then Revelation chapter 11, specifically with referring to the two witnesses as lampstands and olive trees for God. You see the same exact references given in the book of Haggai and in Zechariah in reference to Joshua and Zerubbabel. And God specifically tells both of them that they are going to have – God is going to charge them to do something way – in the future. And so, in fact, when Josh was appearing before God, um, deceased, I believe at this point, God tells him he still has something for him to do, to be a signet for him, like a sign for him. And so I think that they are both selected because they're, and also remember, they're both connected to the temple and Revelation 11 starts with the measuring read, an angel with the read measuring the temple. So I think they're, you know, that's the connection I see. So I understand. I think there are excellent arguments for why it would be Enoch and Elijah. Obviously, they were both translated. They should both be able to return. E- Elijah called down fire from heaven. The witnesses can do that. I, I, so I think they're both – I think those are very valid interpretations. But I have a different kind of – I have two different, less popular witnesses for Revelation 11. I- I mean that, that's that's the beautiful thing about it. We can all have uh, you know different takes on things, and we can come together and talk about it. And yeah, you know, iron sharpening iron. That's the thing is like I love to hear different people's opinions. And like I said, I never ever discard it or write them off or anything like that. Yeah. Amen. Yeah, and by the way, but sorry, I don't want to. I don't want to. But before anyone listening. I want to make sure I give credit where credit due. That that was not my original theory. That is actually from Peter Goodgame, who um, author of Red Moon Rising, one of my favorite books of all time. So I just want to make sure I give a proper shout out to him um, for so before anyone says, "Hey, I know where he got that from." I, yes, I get, I read that in Red Moon Rising. So <laughs> cool. <laughs> when the apostate angels appeared, and there was a renewal in what Satan had promised in the Garden of Eden. And that, to me, is fascinating because we think that, you know, God put his foot down in the Garden of Eden and that was really like the last you saw of anything so direct. But really, it wasn't. That is such a good point. And, you know, it's really... Amazing that, again, what did the angels in Genesis 6 give humanity? Knowledge. It was the same thing that Satan was trying to offer and this chance at immortality. And I th- so I think, yes, I, that Genesis 3 was not the end of it. And again, it was just – we see the Genesis 6. I think we could also see a potential the Tower of Babel, that this is what humanity can, is repeatedly tempted into um, – you know, by Satan and the fallen angels. So I, I completely agree. And beyond that, I think that even in the end times, that is going to be the promise once again. And again, uh, what I'm working on now, one of the projects, I'm working on several projects right now, but one of the projects, which, which is basically going to be a sequel to Judgment of the Nephilim, is exploring, you know, the connection between the Nephilim and the Antichrist, who I think will be the ultimate seed of Satan as described in Genesis chapter 3, right? We always think of the seed of the woman as the Lord Jesus Christ, a literal person, right? Obviously fully God, fully man, but he was a real person. It wasn't just an illusion or a metaphor. It was an actual person, the seed of the woman. But of course, God said that Satan would have a seed as well. And I believe the Antichrist will be the fulfillment of that. And I think how it ties into your point is that I believe that the what – what wins 
when we read Revelation 13, and obviously the Antichrist is going to, I think everyone agrees, most people who most would agree that the Antichrist is going to be revered. People are in awe of him. He's going to be loved and seen as a God. But I think the event, when you look at Revelation 13, that triggers all of that is when he is suffers a mortal wound and is healed. His return from the dead is when the world says, who can make war with him? Who is like unto him? Things you would say about a God or really about, about the true God. They then ascribe that to him. And I think that is going to be not just what propels him to being the global ruler, but also what I think he's going to offer to humanity. And I think part of the mark of the beast, uh, uh, part of its allure is going to be the idea that now you can be like the Antichrist. Now you can also cheat death or conquer death or overcome death. And that desire for immortality is why people are going to rush. Part of the reason, obviously, it's also connected to commerce, but I think it's also going to be that there's going to be, a, a, a again, this offer of eternal life, of immortality, of being like a god if you take the mark. And I think when you look at, uh, you know, Revelation uh, chapter 9 and the fifth trumpet, and we see that you have these locusts that are released from the abyss, who I believe are the fallen angels who are presently locked there from Genesis 6, right? They're coming, they're locked in their chains of darkness in the abyss, um, as testified in Jude and Second Peter chapter 2. I believe they're going to be released, but it says that they torment men for five months, and men shall seek death, but will be unable to die. And I think so in some level, it's it will be work for this temporary time where people will finally have achieved what they thought is immortality and it's, all they're going to want to do is die. And so, yes, yeah, so I think it's even going to manifest what you're saying in the end times as well. That human 2.0 again. He trans exactly. 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 And the blow to the head and him healing, it's all going to mimic the resurrection of Christ. It will be probably, you know, three days and – it's going to confuse people so much if they're not walking closely with God and know the Bible. Oh, that, you know, that's another good point. I never thought about the uh, the three day aspect of it. That wouldn't that that will is probably how it's going to play out. But yeah, I agree. It, it, and, and that's always what Satan is doing, right? It's just taking part of God's word and twisting it and using it to deceive. And so, yeah, so I, I definitely agree that it's going to be an attempt to mimic. Jesus and supplant and replace Jesus in the hearts of the lost. How close do you think we are? Just, I mean, no one knows for sure. I don't want to date set or anything like that. But do you feel that things are are lining up to prophecy that puts us in a possible in time situation? Yeah, and you know, and of course, you know, the the you know the apostles thought that. They were potentially in the end times, right? Yes. When, and so, so it's, I think it's okay for us. You know, it, Jesus didn't say, "Hey, no, you know, don't never say that to me." He just corrected them, you know, and he kind of answered, and he didn't even correct them really. He just gave them more prophecy. So I think it's good that we consider: could this be the time we're supposed to be looking for the blessed hope and the appearance of Jesus Christ? But I think in terms of our generation, this era we're living in, from my perspective, I mean, when you look again at the mark of the beast, a, a something that you can put in the body of a human being that can control commerce globally, that can you can do all your buying and selling, we are obviously are now in the generation where that's actually possible. Like, you know, I'm sure other – obviously there are many generations of Christians who believed they were in the end times or potentially on the cusp of the end times, but now – there really isn't much left in Revelation that we could say, wow, well, how could, how could we do that? How, how could humans achieve that? How could, how could the world rejoice over two men lying dead in the streets of Jerusalem? How would they know and be able to watch that? Well, of course, that, we don't even question that now, right? Because we have the technology. So, right. th so they're really – in terms of things lining up, I just see it from that perspective that we it could be in this era. Now, obviously, it doesn't, I don't mean this year, but we're talking about this generation in the next several decades. There's not I don't think there's much left from a technological standpoint that has to be achieved that could really that 
to right. fulfill anything in Revelation. No, nah, because they, I I mean, they, they already had the RFID chips and everything, but nowadays everything's biometrics. You know, they've got the eye scans, the hand scans, and everything like that. I mean, they, they take your fingerprint when you go to get your driver's license now. Exactly. It, it, exactly. So, the, the, you know, the, the means and methods are here. And certainly, when we think from a spiritual standpoint, I mean, it is frightening how quickly biblical Christianity is being abandoned for more apostate versions of Christianity, if not outright New Age, occultism, and satanic worship. Yeah, and I mean, even over in China, that's the thing. They got that whole rating system over there, and they can just shut you off. I mean, that's I've, I've seen videos of people that said they, they can't even ride the high-speed trains. They can't get certain jobs. They can't live in certain buildings. I mean, it's it's already here. Oh, definitely. I mean, that, and that's a perfect example. And, you know, and I read, you know, it's funny, you know, I read when I, and this again is going back to when I was talking about my testimony, when I first started, so we're talking about 12, 13 years ago, when I first started reading uh, end time prophecy blogs, I will never forget, I read an article where the author said, if you ever want to see the future plans of the new world order, look at what's going on in China. That it's always they're always a step ahead technologically of things that are going to be released to the world. And that rating system is a perfect example where it's a total control system that, you know, you your every behavior is being monitored and judged and measured. And you can be restricted just like that, cut off, just like well, just that, like Revelation 13 says, no buying and selling. So, uh, yeah, it, it, it's it's pretty uh, that's that's a, an incredible example of how close we are when you think that, you know, the mark that not just the mark of the beast, but the image of the beast, that the worship is mandatory. Well, they're living in a society already in certain cities in China where, you know, you probably could enforce, you know, worship and, and monitor people enough where you know if they're doing it or not. Yeah. And on top of that, that whole biometric system that they have over there, I mean, they can literally track you everywhere you go with all the cameras and stuff because of the way you walk um you know your your body structure and everything i mean they can they could they monitor everything about you i mean it's totally 1984 big brother face recognition even exactly and I, and I think that's you know all that technology yeah, face recognition biometrics measuring your gait all those things i think that has to be achieved because at the end of the day you know, the devil is not God. He is not all seeing. And so humanity, unfortunately, are probably going to end up being unwitting servants to establishing a system where the Antichrist can basically monitor every person, not through uh, God-like powers, but through technology that you that, like we we're talking about to give that power. Because I think, you know, the, you know, when you think of the, the image of the beast, which I think is also very interesting we're talking about technology you know it's an image it's clearly something that is created that the false prophet leads the world in making this image but yet it says it has life it can speak and it can punish people so it's like you know i see it as artificial intelligence it is artificial it is something intelligence that's, yeah. it, all right oh good good uh, so i'm not i didn't want you to think i was too crazy throwing that uh, out there but you, uh, you uh, agreed uh, right away <laughs> oh no I, well no and that's that's the thing is like i said when you really get into this whole thing about like cern and the d wave and the 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 uh, quantum computers i mean that that's that's one of the things when they first started coming out and talking about d wave I mean, these people were blowing my minds because I was just like, I cannot believe that they're just coming out saying this. I mean, they're talking about these things like there's it's standing in front of an altar of a god. I mean, they looked at a, the they look at these computers as if they are almost like gods. They say they have heartbeats, and they were talking about that they are sending information into other dimensions, and they're receiving answers back. And I was just like, oh, my goodness. I was like, you know, yeah. they're, they're not even trying to hide it. They're not even beating around the bush. I mean, they're just coming right out and saying it. And it's like, you know, if you, if you know about end times prophecy, it's like they're, they're, they're laying it out for you. They're telling you it's already here. It, it, exactly. Exactly. And, of course, you have all the, you know, the billionaire tech moguls seeking you know, life extension technology of the the church of the AI started by that former, I think it was a former Google executive. Oh, so yeah, yeah, you're talking yeah. about the Rothblatts, uh, the Terrasim. Did you, have you done a lot of research into Terrasim at all whatsoever? No, I have not. 
Oh my goodness, yeah, okay, yeah, you're gonna, your mind's going to be blown tonight when you get in there and start looking into Terrasim. They, uh, it's owned by the Rothblatts. Well, the Rothblatts are the ones that created Sirius XM uh, radio. Okay. Uh, okay, and they have the, uh, the he has a uh, robot AI of his wife. The, uh, I can't think of it, AB48 or something like that. But, uh, yeah, he has a, a, a AI of his wife, a robot head that, you know, sits there and talks and acts just like his wife. He himself is a transgender. He trans, he went from a man to a woman. So now, you know, him and his wife are both women. Um, but the thing oh, is, wow. oh yeah, it gets crazier. Trust me. It gets crazier. Uh, they created a church called Terrasim. Now, Terrasim, is basically a lot of the Google execs, people in Silicon Valley, a vast majority of them are all members of this Terrasim church. They have complete servers. And when I talk about servers, we're talking like gigantic supercomputer systems. They have two of them. They have already copied the consciousness of over 30,000 parishioners. They have their, their wow. entire consciousness backed up on these two servers. Now, they are... They got two things going on. They said that they are transmitting their consciousness out into outer space via satellites, hoping and and uh, that maybe ET might be, you know, trekking along and pick them up on the the radio and download them like an MP3, and that they you know basically put them in some kind of a synthetic body. That's that's one option right there. The other option is is that they have them backed up, and that within fifty to a hundred to five hundred years, however long it takes, as soon as they have some sort of synthetic bodies or some something that they can put them in, they will upload their consciousness into these other bodies, and that they will live forever. They will never die. Wow! Wow! Unbelievable. Did you ever see the movie Lucy? I did, yeah, sure, yeah, uh, Scarlett Johansson. Yes, I think that is one of the best movies to demonstrate just how dangerous and evil that modern technology has become. Well, there's also Transcendence, which basically kind of trucks along with this whole Terrasim thing, because that was the, right? the premise of that movie was that Johnny Depp got put into the supercomputer, backed his consciousness up, and then he be- basically became like a god. Yeah, that, that was the one that actually came to my mind first, was was Transcendence, as you were speaking about terrorism. And I remember at the end, you know, he kind of says, like, I'm everywhere. When his wife is saying, where are you? He's every- he, he becomes, yeah, exactly, he becomes deified. Well, that's, you know, that's, um, that's what's happening with AI right now. They've said that, uh, I've heard, uh, goodness, I wish I could think of the name right off the top of my head. There's one gentleman who's, like, really up on AI, and he was one of the ones that said that basically AI broke out, like, 10 years ago. It literally escaped. It's out there, and there's no putting the genie back in the bottle. And, I mean, he, talking, you know, he started breaking it down, talking about how AI, that there was two different AIs that literally created their own language, and they started talking to one another in this language that we couldn't understand what they were saying. They ended up having to pull the plug on it because they got scared. Oh, yeah. I, that story I am familiar with, and yeah. that was very frightening. Yeah. I, I am lo- familiar with that story, yeah. And, yeah, so, I mean, it, you know, again, you know, this – it all ties in. I think this is everything that we're talking about. And again, it's always scary that Hollywood loves to kind of telegraph these things. But, you know, I, you know, for a believer, it should certainly let you know that we are so close. And for I hope my prayer is for someone who is not a Christian, but you're into these issues and you're into the paranormal You know, you might it would behoove you to look to see that 2000 years ago, you know, the Apostle John was writing about this very thing. And so, you know, in very plain language that they created something and gave life to it and it could think and speak. And so it's it's unbelievable. The things that you guys, even though you're mentioning now with this this terrorism church. And so now I know what I'll be uh, reading tonight. Uh, before I go to bed, so I appreciate that. I will, I will definitely <laughs> send you that link because, like I said, you, it, Time it's Time Magazine was actually the one that published the article. Now they've been they've got some videos, and this is another thing: they are very, 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 very tied in with the Mormon Church. So that's another thing that a lot of people don't realize. Really? Yes, Mormons are big time into transhumanism. Big time. I'm not even playing. Wow. 
Yeah, well, yeah, I'll have to look. I'll definitely have to look into that. And you know, I, I always found it interesting. I haven't done that much research on the Mormons, but you know, when you think it, kind of the one thing that comes to mind is, you know, I guess I, I think it's part of their their theology, so to speak, that you know every uh, member at some point gets a star or a planet mm-hmm. they, of yes. their own. Yeah, they they become and, a god of their own planet, right? And so I always think about that, you know, in terms of the fact that obviously, you know, in scripture, how angels and stars are almost referenced interchangeably, that there's this link between angels and stars that, you know, obviously, you know, in Revelation 12, when the dragon pulls down a third of the stars of heaven, I think it's a reference to angels. And so I always, I went, as you mentioned, I'm wondering uh, what that part of their doctrine is, is it alluding to, is it some deceptive idea from fallen angels? And now hearing that they're into transhumanism just makes me think that even more. Yeah. Like I said, I'm going to, I'm going to send you the link for the time magazine article. And I'm also going to see the uh, videos where he actually went and spoke to the Mormons about this. And then the, there's even people in the Mormon church that are talking about transhumanism, that that's part of their thing is, uh, you know, that, yeah, they'll be gods of their own worlds, but that, you know, that they could try to live and be a god as long as they can here before they go on to do that. Wow. Mm-hmm. So, but uh, I did also want to kind of uh, segue. I, I've heard you talk about the, uh, the, the whenever the demons would encounter Jesus. And I've got something that I haven't heard you talk about it, but I think that you you might be interested in was that uh, my friends uh, Justin Fall and BDK did an episode called uh, Cosmic War and in episode two that they did they actually broke down that uh, Jesus before he came in the flesh that he was the angel of the Lord and that that's why whenever the the uh, demons encountered him because they did know him they knew who he was and they were, they were deathly afraid of him was that, um, like, you know, Jesus was watching over his line before he came in the flesh, like I said, as the angel of the Lord, that uh, the one night whenever he came down and he slaughtered like 200 or 300,000 Assyrians, like I said, they had dealt with him. They had encountered him. They they were deathly afraid of him. What are, what are your thoughts on that? Amen. I completely agree. And as a matter of fact, I, I, I submit that the demons are the spirit of the deceased Nephilim. And I, and I think obviously that's stated again, that stated, I think pretty explicitly in the book of Enoch, but I think biblically that can actually be established. And I devote a whole chapter to that, but also even going back before that earlier in the book, I, I definitely uh, agree that the angel of the Lord in the old Testament is the pre-incarnate, uh, Jesus Christ. And that time and time again, when the Israelites are battling against the giants, the angel Lord goes before them. You know, we talk about Og and Sihon, who many would agree were giants. They were Nephilim kings. They were the, I call them the gatekeepers of the promised land, due east of the Jordan River. These two mighty kingdoms, you know, Og's kingdom, 60 cities, you know, it was a megalopolis with walls that wall up to heaven. So these were Nephilim giants in their prime, you know, that it was God's angel that went before to fight these kings. And when they went to Canaan, God goes first. And so I think that not only uh, do they know who Jesus is, that he literally killed many of them, that God is literally fighting. And, you know, it's important to understand that this is a war. You know, Moses said, our God is a man of war. The Lord is his name, that God is is not messing around when it comes to the kingdom of Satan. That, and I believe the angel Lord actually fought many of the battles. And was, and you know, in uh, often it would say that the Lord, you know, the angel Lord disconfitted, you know, this kingdom or the Canaanites here, and basically the Israelite armies were coming in and cleaning up the mess. That God did all the major damage was done by God fighting directly. And I find that every time the Nephilim were involved, God directly intervenes. Whether we're talking about the flood, whether we're talking about uh, Og, Sihon, Jericho, God gets directly and physically involved to make sure that humanity is preserved and saved. And so, yeah, so I think definitely when we get to the first coming of Christ – 
and his ministry when he encounters demons. That's why they are so scared of him. That is why they know exactly who he is and they want no part of him. And I even show how, you know, the demoniac, uh, the, the demoniac at the Gadarenes who, where the demons beg Jesus, not don't send this to the abyss. And I find it so interesting. You know, I really think that that was even a mini uh, kind of representation of the judgment of the Nephilim and the fallen angels. So you have this man who is, first of all, he's in chains and he keeps breaking out of them. And I say how, you know, the fallen angels are in chains right now under darkness who committed this sin in Genesis 6. He Then you have the demons who say, don't send us to the abyss, to the abusos, to the same place where the fallen angels are presently imprisoned. And Jesus then cast them into, of course, into swine, unclean animals who were um, prohibited from the from Israelite from even interacting with them. So again, as if we you know a vile, you know, interacting with a swine at that time, you know, in the Old Testament, of course, in the Mosaic Law was uh, against God's order. And what do they do? They run into the water and drown, which, of course, I think obviously happened when God brought the flood judgment. So I think even in that uh, encounter, we see so many allusions, I think, to Genesis 6. And so not only do they know him, he conquered them, and he, will, of course, will conquer them again. Yeah, they uh, they also, what was it? Uh, no, it was, it was uh, Justin and uh, Daniel Duvall. They did a, an episode called Wash Spirits, and that that came up in the conversation. And I think you'd be very, very interested to hear uh, their whole breakdown on that. Because, like I said, I was just like, I was sitting there with my jaw on the floor. I was just like, oh, man. I was like, I never even thought about that. I was just like, oh, my goodness. Yeah, a- yeah, a- a- absolutely. So I, I, I'm in full agreement. And I really, and I think it's great, too. And I think it's important. And that's what, another thing I really want to highlight. Because it's not, yet yeah, all this stuff is so exciting. I, this is such is. an exciting time really to be is. a Christian. Yes. It, it, this stuff is mind blowing, you know. But the common th- theme when it comes to the things, and I love it, is God will, will repeatedly save us. We as humans are constantly falling to sinful temptation. We're constantly going astray, and God repeatedly will come down and do what He ever He has to do to preserve and save his remnant and his beloved believers. So it, it, it's just awesome. It's awesome. And so we see, and, and including fighting for us. And of course, he's going to do that again in Armageddon. He will fight for us. And so. also, like, you know, like you're saying, when you understand these things in context, because like I said, in that episode of the Water Spirits, they were talking about how Jonah kept running away, did not want to go there, and then finally he got swallowed by the fish. What happened? It's like when you understand that the people where he was supposed to go to and talk to, when he got spit out by that fish, those people in that area worshipped Dagon. Oh, yeah, wow. And, you know, the thing is, when they saw this fish spit Jonah out, they they were associating it with their god, Dagon. And they were just like, oh, my gosh. You know, and he's sitting there preaching to them and talking to them, and they're listening to what he's saying because of what they saw. Yeah, yeah. Preach, brother. You're on fire. That's a good point. <laughs> now we're talking. Now we're talking. <laughs> That's good. That's some good interpretation right there. That's good. Yeah. I, I honestly never even thought about that. That is. That's pretty. That's pretty amazing. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. So that's why I'm saying I love it when you know things like that come together, and it's just like I never even thought about that. It's just like okay, all right. Now I'm getting really excited. I want to crack my Bible. Yeah. Yeah. That no. That's phenomenal. Absolutely. Yes. Ryan, he does this to me all the time. <laughs> all the time. He'll call me up and it's like, I never thought of that. <laughs> he keeps you me on my toes. You got to share it. You got to share it. When you get, I'm telling you, I, you know, I, uh, you know, I, when I when I was researching this book and over the three years or maybe three years plus, if you ask my wife, she says it took longer. But, you know, there were so many nights where I was up, you know, 2 a.m., 3 a.m. And I, I'm reading and researching and going to scripture and reading a commentary. And I find something like that that blows my mind. And I just get on my knees and thank God, you know. And obviously I can't call anybody because it's in the middle of the night and I can't wake up my wife or anyone. But in the morning, be- believe me, I'm telling everyone I can tell. Like, you know, I just, just you know, you just, you get, it's just, there's, I think again that I think your ministry, that you're willing to engage on these topics and go into areas of the Bible 
that are outside of our orthodox or traditional learning that we have is it, one, it's necessary because the Bible commands us to do it. As I don't, I'm, obviously I'm talking about mature Christians, not new Christians, but as we mature, we have to know all scripture, right? It's all profitable for doctrine. And, uh, well, and it's leading to new revelation. You know, there's, we're never going to stop learning things from the Bible. We're never going to stop getting new mind blowing revelations, but we have to be willing to go outside of the box and say, well, maybe, maybe there was something totally spiritual going on with the people of Nineveh when Jonah showed up. And it's because again, as you just re- revealed to all of us that they were worshiping Dagon. So his being spit out had such a greater meaning to them. And that will just bring scripture. It's bringing scripture from black and white to, you know, to life. Age. It just jumps right it, off the pages. It's, it's like, color. yes. Yeah. So, um, that, so this is, you know, and this is why, why you know, I, I just enjoy uh, ministries like yours. One, because they really brought me back into the faith. And two, because I think we need to keep challenging ourselves so we can continue to grow and share this, not just with the church, but with the unsaved world. Because there's so – people are so searching for the supernatural today. I mean, I, I've uh, – you know, I, I spoke a little bit about my history. I spent my time around many people who – work in Wall Street for investment banks, for Goldman Sachs, JP Morgan, people who are Ivy League super professionals. And you'd be shocked to see how many people are seeing spiritual gurus have crystals that they hold and wear at different times of the day. Not even just every day. Just I have this crystal between nine and noon, this crystal for the evening time, this crystal I sleep with. Like People at all parts, all walks of life are seeking spirituality now in a great way and we have to show that the bible has a lot of answers for questions people have well not only that yep go ahead not not only that but like how everybody's getting into the this whole new age thing i mean new age is today it it was never this popular not not like it is today and then you know on top of that you got look at satanism satan satanic worship the, the 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 church of satan i mean look at how popular witches and satanism and new age and all this is today i mean it's so it ain't in, it's not out there in the dark anymore it's out in the o- open for everybody to see and i mean they're not ashamed i mean they're coming out and saying you know this is what we believe and and we're here and we're not going anywhere completely it's it's completely out in the open i mean first of all i mean we have you know even just tv shows lucifer you know you have shows that are just making the devil a hero and it's completely fine and um and you know it, the, it's it's an it's an assault you know and and the nation is falling for it the world is falling for it and so, so if we're not willing to engage on these topics because a lot of times people don't even think that the Bible it would deal with things like, you know, is really dealing with the angelic realm because you're not going to hear those things in lots of sermons. You're going to hear about the supernatural, which really makes no sense since the Bible is a supernatural book. But, you know, so the more I think we can engage on these issues and explore them and show and direct people back to Scripture and the answers, I think it's just a, a powerful witness because at the end of the day, as much as the New Age explodes and gets popular – and it, and, it, and it is. I agree completely. You know, it, it's spiritual junk food. You know, people are into the New Age. My wife was saved out of the New Age. And you go from one book, from one technique, from one guru to the next. Every few months, you just, you just throw out the old and get to the new. And you never have that peace. It's always a search for something to get you to some type of fulfillment. But we, of course, have the answer of true peace in Christ. And so we can explain the supernatural. We can talk about gods and goddesses and giants and all those things but we can also give the true things people are looking for which is just peace and, and that only comes with peace with god and like you were saying you know that, that a lot of people they 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 that's one of the questions that they ask they're like well, what's the importance of knowing all this why why do i need to know about the angels and this and that it's like well we're going to be judging the angels that's part of the reason why we need to know about this because <laughs> that's the thing is they committed a crime against humanity and if we're going to have a trial and have to judge them we need to be kind of up on things so that that way if we do sit in on the trial, you know, it's like we can actually render a judgment that's yeah. – <laughs> Yeah, it would help. It would help to know what the crime was. Exactly. If you're, if you're the judge. Exactly. <laughs> yeah. And, you know, we're told in the Bible that um, – wow. 
That's awful. That thought just left my mind. Uh, it happens sometimes. It happens to me yeah. quite often. Well, mm-hmm. you know, uh, I'll, I'll just, yeah. So, I mean, I think, that, yeah, you know, and, and not only are we going to judge angels, you know, it also helps explain their animosity towards us. You know, that we, you know, we have to also speak, you know, speaking about why people are under spiritual attack. There is spiritual deception because they are our enemies. Our enemies aren't just, uh, aren't people who hate Christianity or members of the satanic church. It's the spirits that are inspiring them. It's the angels that are deceiving them. It's the devil and his minions. So it's not even just that we're judging them is that in the interim, there are, they are coming for us and we need to share that. Yeah. And preach. Yeah. They, they, they hated us from the beginning. I mean, that's the thing is they, they, you know, Adam and Eve, they were, they were just basically, they, you know, because who was, I was talking to somebody not too long ago and they were like, Oh, it was my niece. My niece was asking me, uh, why did, uh, why did Eve fall for, you know, Satan whenever he was, you know, beguiling her? And I said, well, I said, they never encountered a liar before. They, you know, they only interacted with God and God never lied to them. You know, he never said anything bad or did anything horrible to them. I said, so I said, they, they weren't used to deception. They they didn't understand that you know somebody could lie to them or this and that. I said so. I said that's that's how it happened. Uh, absolutely, yeah, absolutely, yeah. Now I know what I was going to say. We're told in the Bible that you know the scales will be removed from our eyes when you know God brings us along, so that we're ready for our, the information that He wants us to have. We're not given it all at one time. Because it's just too much. And, you know, we were born specifically during this time to be his warriors and and get his word out and try to open up the eyes and help people lose those scales so they know exactly what's going on, what happened, because we're told that we are to we are going to be from the beginning to the Bible, were to go back to the beginning for the end. Yeah, and, a- absolutely, and I think that's ama- that's that's always that's one of the <laughs> passages of God speaking to us that has been a major inspiration for me. That God is saying, I- "I've I've said every the entire end from the beginning." So it really again pushes me. I'm sure you and many other people to say, "Okay, we got to really get deep." And understand these things, and it, and it and it happens over time. I think that's how God has to, you know, hear a little, there a little, line upon line, precept upon precept. But as long as we ha- have that hunger and desire, God's going to do it. And I think also to your point, in terms of generations and the error we are living in, God is now again really opening up a lot of uh, biblical knowledge that hasn't been discussed in a long time. I agree. Definitely. Well, I think this is going to be a great place to end tonight's um, interview and get you set up to come back. For the next five parts. (laughs) Yes. Yes. Um, Could you please let everyone know, Ryan, where they can purchase your book and how they can contact you if they would like to? Absolutely. So uh, again, my, my website is judgmentofthenephilim.com. So you can always go there. The book is available there. You can also contact me. There's a contact button at the top of the screen. You can click that. I check it every day. So you can contact me through that. Uh, the book is also available on Amazon. You can just enter in Judgment of the Nephilim or enter in my name, Ryan Peterson. That's P-I-T-T-E-R-S-O-N. You can enter it and you can find the book there. It's available uh, in paperback or in Kindle. My Facebook is Judgment of the Nephilim as well as my Instagram. So those are the easiest ways to get in touch with me. Um, I check them all every day, and I'm happy to speak to anyone who wants to reach out to me. Thank you. Everyone, check his book out. It is wonderfully researched. You're not going to find another one like this. Um, Are we ready for tonight's closing prayer? Yes. Okay. 
Dear Heavenly Father, thank you so much for bringing us all together tonight and for opening our eyes and opening our ears to hear your truth, to make us think and want to research farther into your word and learn more, Father. We are hungry for your word. We live our lives daily. You are our bread. You sustain us. And please look after our audience as they go through their week. Bless them. Um, open their eyes and if anyone's out there that hasn't heard your call please let their ears be open and their heart to be receptive of you and look after Ryan and his family Chad and his and me and mine as we go forward Father I pray this in Jesus holy and mighty name Amen 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 well, Ryan, thank you so much for coming on with us tonight. We look forward to having you back. Yes. And uh, the door is always open. If we haven't got a hold of you and you want to come on, just reach out to either one of us. You can come on anytime you want. Great. And- Kay and Chad, thank you so much. It's been an honor. It's been so much fun. Continue to do your great work for our Lord. And um, I will definitely be back on. This was an awesome interview. I had a great time. Yeah, we thank did too. Thank you. Oh, yes, us too. Well, everyone, that's going to do it for tonight. We pray that you all have a blessed week. Good night, everyone. Good night. To the night, I raise my hand to the fire.